who is a, a friend and an honored colleague. And I had warned him that I would tell two stories that, he, uh, that I wouldn't tell him in advance. And one is um, about, um, about Rabbi Tucker's intellectual attainments. There was a young woman who graduated some years ago from the rabbinical school at the Jewish Theological Seminary. I think when you were the dean, Jane. I think when you were, you were the dean of the rabbinical school at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And uh, her, I think her first, her first uh, um, escapade as a rabbi was that she was sent to Moscow by the seminary to work in, uh, in the teaching of Jewish studies in the university there, that the Jewish Theological Seminary had good relations with and um, helped to create a Jewish studies program. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Tucker said to his student, have you started to learn Russian? And she said, well, I'm learning a little bit. And then he spoke to her in Russian. <laughs> and she said to me some years later, a couple of years later, she said, he just knows everything. <laughs> Philosophy, you know, sports, Jewish texts, he just knows everything. That, that's kind of the impression that one gets after a bit of a conversation, or if you heard Rabbi Tucker earlier here, he's the, uh, I know a few things about translation, and I can tell you that his translation of Heschel's work, um, Heavenly Torah, is monumental. You could learn how to do, it's a course in how to translate, to read the book with the Hebrew and the English open. Um, his collected essays, uh, Torah for its intended purposes, is um, uh, probably way overly neglected, unfortunately, but a really, really fascinating set of essays on the things that you and I care most about. Uh, in terms of our Jewish lives at the very least. Um, and also the author of a commentary to a vote that's about, about, about to be published, uh, along with a commentary by um, our own Israeli uh, Rabbi Tamar El-Ad Apoba uh, in English. I translated the English, yeah. And then the editor actually made it legend understandable, thank God. Um, the other story I wanted to tell you uh, by way of introduction is not about, is not about Rabbi Tucker, it's about John F. Kennedy. Um, when he became president of the United States in 1961, he appointed his younger brother, Robert F. Kennedy, as attorney general. People thought, and no one could get away with that today. And, and, and uh, the press did, did, quest, did question him on that. And uh, I know that was supposed to be not, not funny. I just realized, oh my God. <clears throat> Those are the Americans who laughed. Yeah, they met. Um, so someone said something about having appointed his rather young and fairly inexperienced younger brother. He actually, uh, Robert Kennedy had been a, uh, um, the, uh, the lawyer for Senate committees and stuff. I mean, he, he had some experience. But when asked about it, the, um, the newly elect elected president said, well, the family thought maybe it would be nice if we could get some, to have a little bit of experience before he goes out and works as an attorney. So we made him attorney general. Um, uh, Rabbi Tucker went from being the dean of the uh, rabbinical school at the Jewish Theological Seminary and having come there from a, a rather accomplished academic career in, from top to bottom and bottom to top, whatever it is, in some of America's finest universities, the Doctor of Philosophy. And then he became the rabbi of the what's it called, Temple Israel Center in White Plains. Um, and what uh, I've learned from many people over time is that just as like the story I told you, Rabbi Tucker's accomplishments as a dean were beyond the intellectual. Um, and maybe I didn't say that, but he was, uh, to a generation of rabbinical students, a, a caring mentor and an approachable person and someone with whom they had developed very close personal ties, and I assume those continue. Um, that was also true in the people that I'm, I used to come to the second month at Camp Roma in New England after Gordon Tucker had been there the first month and heard all about this amazing rabbi who knew as much about basketball as Torah and spent as much time out in basketball as Torah and didn't think that there was any, any contradiction between the two. Um, so from that, he, he kind of switched around and became uh, a rabbi of a congregation whose congregants uh, also feel very much embraced and loved and cared for and known by their rabbi, their senior rabbi in a very large congregation, and still challenged intellectually and, uh, and challenged, prodded, and guided intellectually as well. Um, all that, and I think you're the rabbi most likely to be confused with the 1960s folk singer, Tom Rush. <laughs> I don't think even he knows who that is. Um, uh, rabbi Tucker is going to speak to us today about Beyond the Boundaries of Halakha, Theology, Zionism, and Masoti Judaism.
about, which he, about all of which he knows a great deal. But I guess I forgot to mention that he's been one of the leaders of our support foundation in uh, the United States. Took a leading role for a long period of time in that as well. And for that, we are all very grateful. Thank, thank you, Paris. Uh, uh, when, the, when the Pierre Caveau book comes out, I hope that you will enjoy his, his translation. Um, and he is a translator and a, and a, and a darn good one, too. So um, you, you can look forward to that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm used to uh, having this little um, anxiety and terror about what stories are going to be told, because I have four, college, uh, four high school classmates in my congregation. And uh, we, we all know where all the bodies are buried, so we, we keep a very respectful silence. Um, and one last thing um, about Russian. She probably heard all of the Russian that I remembered from high school. See, I started high school in 1963, and it wasn't that long before. We were still in the United States, we were still in this panic that uh, the Russians were ahead of us in the space uh, race and all of that. And at the Bronx High School of Science, they were teaching Russian because that was going to be the scientific language of the future. Not exactly, but uh, so we all took Russian. And uh, mostly I remember the songs. But it's actually now Russian, Russian comes in handy here in Israel now, as you know. So um, I, was, uh, I was first asked uh, uh, by Yizhar Hess to, to speak about um, halakha. Uh, which uh, I've, I've done many times in the past and uh, in some sense would be happy to do, I guess. But um, I said to him, I, I really don't feel that I want to do that uh, per se. I, I really would like to talk about what lies beyond it. Uh, and uh, it's largely because my, uh, my daily work for nearly 24 years now uh, has been the work of a congregational rabbi, and it's uh, primarily in that capacity that I'm, uh, that I'm speaking to you today. Uh, because doing that work has uh, got me more and more involved in and appreciative of uh, the spiritual dimensions of life and specifically of Jewish life and what you can learn from the actual lives of Jews in a Jewish community uh, who may or may not be Halachic Jews, in the canonical sense of that term, who may or may not even be what we might call rabbinic Jews. Uh, a good number of years ago, um, I was uh, part of a, a conference that my, um, my good friend uh, Larry Hoffman organized to kind of be thinking about uh, what, what was in store for Judaism and Jewish communities <coughs> in the 21st century. And, um, uh, Professor uh, David Beal, uh, who was at the Graduate Theological Union at the time, and has been at UC Davis, um, he gave a paper there that where he, something that he said um, really stuck with me. At first, it, I was a kind of uh, bothered by it, but over the years, I've come to understand the wisdom in it. I'm just going to read you this little <coughs> excerpt from this paper. He said that we can turn to the responsa literature, the literature of Chuvot, that uh, you know, are responses to queries that are sent to rabbinic authorities. We can turn to that literature not only for a history of halakha, even a history of its minority opinions, but also for evidence of actual practices by Jews who lived their lives outside the Beit Midrash and the Beit Din. When I was um, when I was considerably younger, which I was at the time, this uh, sort of created a little friction in my head. Uh, why, would we, why would we care about Jews who were living their lives outside the Beit Midrash and the Beit Din? Not, of course, as human beings, but as opinion makers. And he said, this is not a call for doing social history as opposed to intellectual history. This isn't to erase the, the literature of the elite but rather for studying the tensions and interactions between texts and practices, between the intellectual elites and the broader culture of which they are a part. Um, it, uh, it rings much truer to me today. Um, 
I guess uh, you'd say I was uh, then I was so much older then. I'm younger than that now, uh, as a great Nobel laureate once sang. Um, <laughs> So I, w I wanted to put that on the table right at the start so that you understand, first of all, uh, I'm not here to negate the world of halakha. I sat on the Rabbinical Assembly Law Committee for 25 years. Um, I, uh, I, I receive halakha questions in my congregation. I do have to play the role of a posek halakha. But uh, it, is, uh, it is to say that there are things that are, I'll just give you a preview of this phrase that uh, I I think is original to Heschel. I don't think, I don't, I know, I, I have never seen it anywhere else. The phrase, Lifnim Mishurat HaHalacha. Uh, you probably know the phrase, Lifnim Mishurat HaDin. I will get it to you, I will get back to it very quickly. Um, but that's so, uh, not a really easy phrase to translate into English. I did my best with beyond the boundaries of Halacha, but I'll explain what it means. Um, uh, so it is, it is to explore what's What's beyond? And I, I promise to get back to a little better explication of this. But about the identification uh, of Judaism with halakha, so again, this isn't a session about Heschel, uh, but it happens that, uh, that Heschel had this um, important insight that um, a, a, what he called a, a toxic a toxic um, identification or a toxic identification of Judaism with halakha began, oddly enough, with Baruch Spinoza in the 17th century. Uh, Spinoza insisted that Judaism was simply a system of law. For him, that was not a compliment, you understand, uh, because he thought, what is a culture doing that hasn't had any sovereignty for 1,600 years or more uh, doing, preserving a legal system? It's, he thought it was insane. Uh, but that's what Judaism was. It, could, it was not religion. Religion was something that had to be more universal. It couldn't be the particularistic law system of a particular culture. So Spinoza, um, as Heschel put it, it was Spinoza who injected this toxin into the bloodstream of Judaism, and it truly became toxic when it metamorphosed in a way that Spinoza probably never could have imagined in the more traditional, in the most traditional of circles into not anymore a derogation of this, but an insistence that, in fact, halachic thinking and theological thinking were, in fact, separate and distinct, and Judaism really was captured by the world of halakha, and theological thinking was useful, it had some heuristic power, but it didn't have any normative power. The recognition of this danger is not new. Um, so the Talmud in Yevamot says, Lo min hashabbat atamit yarei ela mimisha piked al hashabbat. Don't stand in awe of the Shabbat, but stand in awe of the one who commanded the Shabbat. Sounds like it could have come from the Christian Bible, actually. Okay. Um, that's in Yivamot, in Tractate Shabbat, uh, a, a phrase that's probably a little better known, that whoever has Torah but no Yirat Shemayim, no reverence for heaven, is like a treasurer who has the keys to the inner vault, but not to the outer doors. How's he supposed to enter? Uh, there uh, was a faculty member for a good number of years at uh, Hebrew Union College, uh, died now I guess about 40 years ago now. Uh, Samuel Atlas was a uh, professor of philosophy and Talmud. Um, he, uh, he wrote an essay called Man and the Ethical Idea of God. And he said, if we have a world of complete regularity and law, then there's no place for the human being as an ethical, ethical being. Because it's only in a world that is not completely fixed that a consciousness of duty and a marshalling of passion and an act of daring, an interesting word, an act of daring motivated by faith, only then will it be possible. And 
such a, such a view, I think, takes with dead seriousness the idea that God has utter and absolute freedom from all human constraints, even as it allows that the human mind and spirit, in ways that are somewhat mysterious, can touch the divine and be touched by it. Uh, being, having this idea, and this also connects in many ways to Heschel, who talked about the, in, the intuitive grasp of something about the divine pathos and the divine will, uh, obviously there is not, th this does not possess the kind of objective uh, regularity, the objective fixity, the certainty that, uh, that law gives us. And the uncertainty that must attend this is one of the many reasons why we create law, because it gives us stability and consistency. The question is, how big a price have we paid for this? And uh, I promise you we will get eventually to what this has to do with the movement. You're wondering what it has to do with Zionism. So let's talk about Achad Ha'am now. So Achad Ha'am wrote an essay in 1894 uh, it was called uh, HaTorah Shebalev, uh, the, uh, the, the Torah of the heart. Uh, he, uh, he says the following in there, and this is my translation of it. The Jewish people so believed in its power that it allowed itself to seek out its Torah within itself with the words, what is hateful to you, do not do to another person. And this forced the written word to develop in accordance with contemporary needs. This essay was an open letter to friends in the agricultural settlements in what was called Palestine at the time. Um, it was written in the midst of a critical time of transition for world Jewry. There had been waves of anti-Semitic violence in the Russian Empire for more than a decade, which along with economic struggles were triggering, was triggering increasingly large Jewish demographic shifts, both to America and also to Ottoman Palestine. And the growing Jewish community in the land of Israel was engendering new ways of understanding Jewish identity and aspirations. There was a flowering of different ways of expressing what it is to be Jewish. And Achan Ha'am knew that something more than the glorified agricultural labor promoted by this so-called first aliyah was going to be needed in order to meet these many challenges. He was, in this essay, beginning to defend what would become, come to be known as cultural Zionism. But he did it in a way that not only spoke to his particular time and setting, it was also highly relevant to every moment of critical transition in the history of Jewish society and of Jewish culture. So his principal conceit in this essay was the distinction between what he called an am sifruti, that is, a literary people, and the contrast between that and being am hasefer, people of the book. He said that a living literature invites an ongoing process of cultural renewal, and a literary people is one that embraces the invitation engaging in a redefinition of its values and goals in response to the ever-changing circumstances of life. Achad Ha'am insisted that this should not be seen as inimical to the activism of the labor Zionist pioneers. What was to be rejected was the cultural stasis intrinsic to being defined not by an organically growing literature, but rather by canonical books. He wrote that generations come and go, and the people lives through them all. Books also come and go. And the ongoing literature lives through them all. The only people worthy of the description, am sifruti, literary people, is one whose life and the life of whose literature, its generations and its books, develop together. The literature develops in conformity with the needs of the generations, and the generations develop in conformity with the spirit of its literature. So the role of the literature of such a people, he said, is to sow in the furrows of the heart of its men and women new ideas, and then to leave those seeds in the charge of the heart, which is to take them in and grow them with its own power according to its needs. And in the end, they become 
an organic part of the autonomous living force in the human soul. A literary people allows itself to articulate what the broader cross-generational meanings of its sacred texts really are, to epitomize them, as Hillel had done by saying, what's hateful to you, do not do to someone else, and by epitomizing them, enabling them to, be, to hold its developing culture accountable to those epitomies. To what extent is our developing culture, to what extent is our developing halakha true to this epitomization? So that's what Hillel had done, and why, even 1900 years later, it was seen by Achad Ha'am as such a crucial cultural advance. And he said the oral Torah, Torah Shebaal Peh, should really always have been called the Torah Shebaalev. The, and where the Lev here really is talking about the, the heart of the people. And if you object that that's not so well defined, because the people is not so well defined, an individual is pretty well defined, even though the heart of the individual may be a little tougher to nail down. This is alachat kama vachama, all the more so. But nevertheless, the heart of a people, the heart of a culture, has to find its expression. It may not necessarily be through its law books, though it cannot be oblivious to them, and has to hold them accountable, as the laws have to hold the epitomizations accountable as well. So this was um, really um, one, uh, one of the important expressions of what Zionism was about for thinkers like him. To, uh, to now be able to, to enable a, a people that was, um, that was uh, denied and constricted from the opportunities uh, to create this kind of cultural flowering, to be able to do that and to uh, and to free itself from what he actually called a kind of slavishness to its books, um, to become bearers of those books, but not slaves to them. Heschel, um, in Torah Min HaShemayim, it's only a matter of time before I would get to that, of course, um, talks about, this is where he introduces the phrase, Lifnim Mishurat HaHalacha. Uh, because he's, he talks about with a kind of lament as to why the, 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 the stories of our people, and uh, I'm, this doesn't mean you know, bedtime stories, this means the, the real narratives of a people and the narratives of life that come out of the real experiences in the world, these things that we, that are com that, that we collectively call agada, narration, narrative, um, he laments the fact that it has, um, this, is where, this is where Spinoza's venom comes in, has been demoted. Anyone here who has had the occasion to, uh, to study in a, uh, in a fairly traditional Beit Midrash uh, will know what I experienced as, uh, in my early education, that uh, we're going to skip the next five pages in the Talmud because it's only Agadah, right? It's on, there was usually the word only there. Uh, this bothered Heschel a great deal. And uh, borrowing a phrase from Pirkei Avot, he said, there are those who say of Agadah, Mana e ilanze, how beautiful is this tree? But they don't think of how deep that tree's roots go. They just think it's a superficially beautiful thing to, to remark on as you're passing by. They see the flowers, but do not attend to the fruits. And as we'll see, he's kind of referring to Bialik here. We'll get to that in a bit. He said that true Jewish learning consists not in confining oneself simply to halacha, but rather in deep consideration of what lies lifnim mishirata halacha. So let's just take this phrase here now and really uh, uh, make sure that it's, it's understood. So this is a play on the phrase lifnim mishirat hadin. So lifnim mishirat hadin is usually defined as, um, it, 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 could, it could be translated in, in You'll see it translated in a number of ways um, as uh, going beyond the letter of the law, going beyond the call of duty, going the extra mile. It could be, you find lots of different paraphrases and translations. But it's worth understanding where the phrase actually comes from. The shurat din think about property lines. That line is what defines what is mine and what is yours. The fiadin. Al-Piyadin, according to the law. 
Lifnim Mishurat Adin, acting in that way, which by the way, in a, in a pretty famous passage, the Talmud in Bava Metzia tells us that that's why Jerusalem was destroyed, because they did everything legally and didn't go Lifnim Mishurat Adin. Lifnim Mishurat Adin literally means inside the line of the law. It's when I allow you to encroach on my territory a little bit. I allow you to expand your rights because I I'm not going to be hurt by it. Maybe I even am going to be hurt, but I make the de decision and the estimate that my hurt is as nothing compared to your advantage. I do it because we are in a human relationship with one another. And uh, it is, it, so you, you want the, the simplest example is, uh, I'm going away for several weeks, and my neighbor says I'm having a party, and I'd like to have my guest park in your driveway. I'll pia din. I can say no. Shalish shaliva shalach shalach. What's mine is mine. What's yours is yours. But there is something grotesque about it uh, if I if I don't allow you to do that. Now, Heschel's talks now about lifnim mishurat ahalacha which means that th there, there needs to be, the, the halakha itself may have to give way to other considerations that are part of the, the ethos and the Torah Shebalev, as Achar uh, put it, of the people as they, begin, as they continue the development of the understanding of what Judaism really is about and why we are doing these things to begin with. Um, he says, from the depths of the drashot that are often derided as just being only agada, lie always serious, serious and sometimes troubling concerns that need to be worked out. And then he says, the contemporary Jew, who is thirsty for matters of thought and principle, finds in the Beit Midrash sometimes just a salted crust or a pinch of carob. It's as if a voice echoes from the treasury of Jewish thought and says, and uh, I'll tell you where this phrase comes from in a moment, I have so many coins and yet no one to make currency of them. This was, uh, this was Rabbi Akiva's eulogy for his teacher Rabbi Eliezer when he died. Um, he said, I've got all these coins, I've got all these things that I get from, um, from the world of halakha that I have studied, but now I don't have the person I truly need to make currency of them, to make them cohere, to give me a sense of why we are doing all of this. That's how Heschel imagines uh, an anonymous voice just kind of echoing from this treasury of Jewish thought with that same lament. So now I'm going to give you a sense. Um, it's Tu Bishvat today. Full moon. Uh, usually we say that we begin dealing with the laws of Pesach 30 days before Pesach at the Adar full moon, but I'm going to take it back another month and we're going to talk about Pesach for a few minutes here. Um, because it is two full moons away. And uh, I want to I uh, talk to you about um, in a very powerful message that uh, I have come to believe is sitting there in the Haggadah before our eyes that is, uh, is generally we have not seen. The four children. So you know what the Haggadah says. There are four children. One is wise, one is wicked, one is tam, simple, innocent, innocent, and one doesn't know to ask. And there are psukim in the Torah that uh, relate to all of these. There are uh, all sorts of issues with this passage that I don't have to remind you of. Why are there three intellectual categories and one uh, moral category? Why, are, why do the verses not exactly line up with the answers? Uh, we're not going to rehearse what those, um, what those problems are. But I do want to remind you of what it says. What does the wise child ask? What? Ma, ma ha'edot. What are the decrees, laws, and rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? 
מה העדות והחוקים והמשפטים אשר ציווה ה' אלוהינו אתכם. When that question is asked, you're supposed to recite for the child all of the laws of Pesach right down to the rules of the Afikoman. What does the wicked child ask? What, ma, is the meaning of this service of yours? Ma ha'avodah hazot lachem. Did you hear? The child said, of yours, this service of yours. The child didn't say, of mine. So you give it right back to this child. As the verse says, it was for this that God took me out of Egypt. Me, not you. Had you been there, you would not have been rescued. What does the innocent child ask? What, ma, is this, ma zot? So you answer by saying, God took us out of Egypt with a strong arm, chozek yad. And now comes the child who doesn't know how to ask. So you begin with this child, at petach lo. Start at the beginning and tell the child, it was for this that God took me out of Egypt. Now I want you to imagine that this is not actually about four children. I want you to imagine this is about a single child. And about the parents' reactions to what that child says as their dialogue proceeds. Now here's how the dramatic play looks. The first and the second questions, objectively viewed, are more or less equivalent to each other. Ma ha'idot v'achukim v'amishpatim and ma ha'avodah azot lachem. They both begin with ma, which in biblical Hebrew can mean what, but often enough it can also mean why is it, or what is the meaning of. Seeing the various rites that the parent is performing, seeing these practices that are hardly universal, the child wants to know why is the parent living this way? Why does the parent think it's important to pass this on to his child? But the parent prefers to understand ma in its easier meaning of what. And so instead of answering what the child really needs to know, the parent answers the what question. Well, here's a catalog of all you need to know about living a Jewish life, right down to the afikon. And probably says, am I not a good parent, a teacher, and aren't you a wise child? But the child actually hadn't asked a what question. The child had asked the crucial why question, which may be perhaps the most important question that anyone of any age can ask. Having gotten the catalog of rules, the child now feels the need to clarify what the meaning of the original question was. So he says, no, what I meant was, tell me the meaning of this service of yours. Tell me why we do this. Now the parent is deeply embarrassed. Why? Because, like so many of us, the parent actually hasn't thought very deeply about why we should be doing what we do as Jews. Wow. And why we want our children to continue those practices. And why we revere the halachot that we can meticulously observe if we do. We are, like the parent, much more comfortable with what questions than with why questions. And so the second child, who really is just the same child, re-asking the original question, is now called wicked for asking such an impertinent question. When you're asked a question that deeply embarrasses you and you don't know how to answer it, one of the things you tend to do is challenge the legitimacy of the question. So the child is now perplexed and now asks, Mazot, in all innocence, which is the meaning of Tam, the child wants to know why this kind of abusive treatment is forthcoming from a parent who's supposed to be a teacher. What is this? What's, why is this happening? So the parent only has one answer. It's Bechozek Yad. It's God's strong arm that resulted in our being in God's service. In other words, the parent, unable and unwilling at least to engage, if not answer, the essential question, now actually undermines the entire point of the Passover message. Because service of God becomes now just like service of Pharaoh. We must simply respect the strong arm, the power, and not make trouble with why questions. So the outcome of all of this is sadly predictable. The child has now been taught it's better not to ask questions. And now the text offers the only possible
full advice, which is at petach lo. You'd better begin with this child all over again. And say, Ba'avur zeh asad and I leave it say Timi Mitzrayim, not emphasizing the Lee anymore, but saying, it was for this reason that God took me out of Egypt, so that I could be the kind of parent who receives and answers why questions. For this is why our ancestors were freed and why people everywhere yearn to be free so that we can go beyond what and are able to ask the signature human and Jewish question, why? So this is an answer to, this is a, an illustration, I think, of what it means to be lifnim mishirat halacha, which is not a negation of halacha, but a sense that these why questions have to in, impinge. They have to be allowed into this domain. They have the, the, the realm of out, outside, the realm of actual life, the realm of Jews who are living out their lives as Jews, maybe not the kind of Jew you want them to be, but the kind of Jews they want to be, and maintaining some continuity. And we're here, not only because of the rabbinate Jews, but because of all the Jews who have held on to their Jewishness. This is, um, this is the illustration of what it means to have to engage with what lies outside that law and bring it inside, lifnim, yeshurat, ha So I mentioned Bialik before. And uh, so Bialik wrote, an essay called Halacha Agada, and Heschel clearly was referring to it. Uh, you remember Heschel talked about the flower and the fruit. So Bialik wrote the following. Chalom ratz v'nimshach el ha-pitaron, ha-ratzon el ha-maser, ha-machshava el ha-mila, ha-perach el ha-peri, v'ha-agada el ha-halacha, v'ulam, gam betoch ha-peri, kvar ganuz ha-garin shemimenu Dreams are drawn to their interpretations that activate them. The will is drawn to the actions that fulfill it. Thoughts are drawn to the words that express them. The flower strives to give way to the fruit, and thus does agada lead to halacha. And yet, within the fruit itself, there is always a latent seed from which a new flower is destined to emerge. So what about our situation today? Think about the things we deal with, and there are so many of them, but we'll just take a little slice. An interesting thing to me is that in the, in the Tanakh, the word goy means a nation. We are a goy. Everyone else is a goy. In rabbinic literature, now goy means someone who's not Yisrael. What happened? We were taken off the continuum? We're no longer on that continuum of nations? What, are, what about the commonalities that maybe actually were better sensed in the world of the Tanakh than later on in difficult times of the rabbinic sages. Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, an official at the Ministry of the Interior said about our um, aspiring immigrant uh, from Kenya who wanted to study at the conservative yeshiva and was detained at the airport. So Amar Sarbel said, I hate to say it, but for us, he's just a goy from Kenya. A goy from Kenya. We have to, uh, we have to take account of something that is beyond that line of the halacha and bring it in, which is what it means suddenly for us to be a refuge rather than to need a refuge. Mm -hmm. This is a different set of circumstances. 
And those experiences and those narratives are going to have to say something to us. Here I'm going to give you a little bit of Torah that is not mine. Um, I'll bring a little redemption to the world by telling you whose it is. It's Rabbi Jason Rubenstein, who is a, happens to be a colleague of my son's. You should love the ger, the stranger usually translated because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Really? Are we supposed to treat the gerim the way we were treated in the land of Egypt? And his answer is yes. But not by Pharaoh 2. We're supposed to remember Pharaoh 1. When we were refugees, and just to emphasize the point, we were not refugees from political persecution. We were refugees from hunger. We were economic refugees. And the Torah commands us to remember how we were saved by a pharaoh that was happy to give us a place and never to forget that. This isn't halakha, but this is, this is something that is supposed to dwell in the hearts of the nation. This is supposed to be the Torah Shebalev. Connected with this, how about this phrase, chasid umot ha'olam? Actually, the, the one of the earliest, maybe the earliest uh, 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 example of it, or instance of it, is, is a slightly different phrase, tzaddik umot ha'olam, uh, in the Tosefta. Yesh tzaddikim ba'umot, sheyesh lahem chelek lo'olam haba. There are righteous people among the nations who, because they are righteous, have a share in the world to come. Later on, it becomes uh, in the Mishnat Rabbi, uh, uh, Rabbi Eliezer, and, um, and later in the Rambam, it becomes the more familiar phrase, Chasidu Mota Olam. Uh, what does that phrase mean today? What has it morphed into? Chasidu Mota Olam has morphed into the description for someone who saved Jews. Good thing to do, an exemplary thing to do something to be eternally grateful for. But is that the meaning of Hasid Umot HaOlam? If you visit, probably many of you have, Oscar Schindler's grave at the Christian cemetery at, uh, at Hartzion, you'll see there's his gravestone with a cross, his name, his dates, uh, an inscription in German that says the unforgettable rescuer of the Jews who were persecuted. And right in the middle in Hebrew letters, Hasid Umot HaOlam. But Hasidu Mot HaOlam is supposed to apply even to people in Tibet who never even heard of a Jew. It's supposed to apply to people who live decent, moral, humane lives. That's what it meant for Rabbi Eliezer in the Tosefta. Now it's become about us. You're a Hasidu Mot HaOlam if you did something for me. And there's something a little pernicious about that, right? Not to take one iota of credit away from the rescuers of Jews, but what has it done to, um, to constrict the meaning of this soaring phrase, something that we should take enormous pride in, that we never went through a phase, well, we did, but officially we go way back with this idea that you don't only get salvation through us. Something that other religions have been tripped up by. And, and it's been constricted. So we have to take account of that now. What, what does this tell us? What does this phrase tell us about our common humanity? About the fact that someone who is a decent person, who means no harm, who is fleeing starvation, or certainly fleeing persecution. What does it mean to say that they have a share in the world to come but can't have a share in, the, in a society, in a country that is prosperous, thank God, uh, and able to do a lot more than it does? One of the things that um, my teacher, um, a very blessed memory, Gerson Cohn, 
Zichrono Livracha, loved to teach. <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me. And then he had a, a little bit of a, of a turning back on it. What he loved to teach was something about the, the biblical phrase, you know, when Rivka needs to know something about what's going on with this pregnancy and what the meaning of it is, it says, she went to inquire of God. It doesn't say how she did that, but somehow there was going to be some, some way of connecting with the divine will. And uh, what my teacher used to love to point out was that when you get to the latest stratum, or almost the latest stratum in the Bible, the book of Ezra, the book of Ezra says, Ki Ezra hechin levavo lidroshet Torat Adonai. Suddenly a new word has entered into the old locution, the old phrase. Ezra uh, took it upon himself to inquire of God's Torah. Inquiring of God's Torah became kind of the model for seeking God's will primarily or maybe only through the books to be the Am HaSefer, as uh, Achad HaAm would put it. But later in, uh, in his life, which was uh, much shorter than it should have been, uh, he came to understand, and many of his speeches reflect this, that uh, he was, in a way, a little too hasty to dismiss Lidrosh et Adonai, and that we have to be concerned with how are the things that we're doing comport with our best understanding of what the will of God is. Uh, some of you may remember a kind of what became a kind of a notorious article, but a very important one by Chaim Soloveitchik, um, it must be 25 years ago now, um, which uh, talked about the, the ways in which the culture of the authority of the book and the authority of the um, of the of, of the Rav Muvhak of the pr the principal teacher um, came to dominate particularly the uh, the Baal Tshuva culture, and he ended this long essay with the following phrase, which I hope it haunts you as much as it continues to haunt me. Having lost the touch of his he wrote, his, God's presence, they now seek solace in the pressure of his yoke. This is a Soloveitchik writing this, who is lamenting something about the loss of some kind of immediacy, the loss of some kind of intuition, the loss of a Torah Shebalev, the loss of something that can, uh, in, in addition to caring about the ways in which halakha can be, can be mined and interpreted so as to help people who may have been uh, disadvantaged by it in the past. I'm not gainsaying, gainsaying the importance of any of that. But that in a larger sense, we have to be able to ans ask and answer that question, ma ha'avodah hazot lachem, what is this really about? What is a Jewish state really about? What is a Jewish community in the diaspora really about? What should we be raising our voices for, even if the halakha doesn't require it, even if the halakha tells us in some sense not to? But the urgency of it, it becomes overwhelming. I think that the Masoti movement should take pride in what it has done in the realm of halakha, but I think that it's even truer vocation as a Zionist movement, and as a modern movement, and as a Jewish movement, is to insist that the ultimate question, ma ha'avodah hazot lachem, always gets asked and never gets summarily dismissed. And in this, it has to be open not just to teaching those who don't yet know, not just to keruv vis-a-vis those who are not our kind of rabbinic Jews, but to accept happily, happily, the possibility that there is much to be learned from and be enriched by these not quite rabbinic Jews, and in so doing, advance the Torah of the heart. Maybe, uh, maybe a good slogan for the Masorti movement would be uh, Torah Belev Ha'am, or something along those lines. I throw that out as just a, a thought and a suggestion. And uh, I'm going to stop here and, and invite uh, whatever comments and questions you have. Your register of English does not mas have to match his, by the way. Karen. So, what are we going to do about the Ministry of Interior? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> what are we going to do about the Ministry yeah. of the Interior? Yes, talk to us. I want to hear some ideas. Yeah, well, uh, uh, we, we got to this at the very end of the session I was in last, uh, last period. Um, we were talking about Heschel, and I uh, recalled that uh, Heschel's um, indignation uh, about uh, th things that were happening and atrocities that were happening in his name as an American in Vietnam caused him to, to get up in a meeting with Robert Rat McNamara and say, according to William Sloan Coffin, this is obscene. It didn't stop the war, but it was apparently a moment that, that stuck with a lot of people. Um, I think there has to be, uh, and listen, there is, there's never a guarantee when you, when there is a disparity of, 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 of power and authority, but uh, to abdicate the, uh, the need to be calling out about this, we are, we're, we're facing the same thing in the United States, as you well know. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, there were many, many rabbis who, uh, who flooded the halls of Congress, uh, were, uh, were arrested because they were saying something along Heschel's lines that we can't in good conscience accept that this is going to be done in our name, that young children um, who uh, brought, came to the United States through no fault of their own um, are not going to be able to, uh, to live a, a life of tranquility and a life uh, free of anxiety that uh, tomorrow uh, the ax may fall on them. Uh, uh, they were in effect saying something about banim lo yimtu alavot. Children are not supposed to have their lives ruined because of something that their parents did. And their parents may not have even done something so horrible because they were fleeing even though it was against the law but certainly the children have. So uh, I, I can't give you a formula for how to change the attitudes of the government, neither here nor back in my home, but uh, yeah. Who gives the Lo ben where does their mimeno. From? I'm sorry? I'm just saying, where does their authority come from? Their Why? authority? Yeah, to, to refute this Uganda guy in our, you know, with a visa. Well, if they have authority or not is something that has to be decided by the courts. But the fact that they have the authority to do something doesn't mean that it's right. Exactly. Yeah. There is even there, there is there's even a halachic phrase that one could uh, refer to here, even though it wasn't created for this. But in the spirit of it, we, we now speaks from the heart as to what this is about. Inui hadin is forbidden. You can't keep someone's 
someone's legal jeopardy hanging any a minute longer than it needs to. So for the Ministry of the Interior to say, we'll get to your thing maybe in the next three years, I just heard stories like that uh, during, during the lunch period, yeah. is simply Inui Hadin. And if someone says to you, no, well, that's not what Inui Adin meant classically, halachically, the answer is, we're talking about Lifni Mishurara Halacha now and what this Torah Shavalev is about. Uh, and if we are not, and now I'm saying we, I'm presuming to say we, as a member of the Jewish people, so I'm saying we as a society in Israel that uh, is the, um, is the uh, concretization and the realization of, of Zionism, um, if we are not going to be able to let those um, implications of what our faith is supposed to be about flower in this, uh, in this blessed situation that we are in now, uh, having our own power and our own state, then what, what is the point of Zionism? What is the point of halacha? What is the point of any of it? Yeah, so be before I answer, I just want you to clarify a little bit what you mean by our movement is done, not done well enough with the what. I, I, I just spell it out, if you would. We don't actually do anything? Okay. I don't know. Most of the people I know do a lot of things. But yes, oh, that's the accusation. I see. In the realm of... Okay, so look, part of what I'm saying, obviously, is that uh, we would do better, rather than pouring the energy that we often pour into, uh, proving to people of other movements that we can conform to their standards of authenticity, we would do better to pay attention in it to not, again, I, I feel like I keep having to say this and it sounds so apologetic, it's not to say halakha is unimportant but to pay attention to the things that we learn from people like Achad Ham and people for like Bialik, uh, and uh, people like Moshe Halbertal, by the way, who, uh, who, who wrote very, uh, almost, almost the same words um, that uh, the Heschel wrote uh, earlier about, you know, getting uh, the Beit Midrash sometimes gives you, sim sometimes seems to give you just a little bit of a salty crust and a little pinch of carob. Uh, the way Halbertal put it is what happens in the Lithuanian yeshivot is that for some people who are, who are happy to create a world within a world and be, you know, and, and find that to be paradise, bevakasha. But for many people, he says, it leads them to an empty trough because they're, they're looking for religion. And law can be a part of religion, but not if it doesn't come from the heart and, and touch the heart. Now, um, Peretz was kind enough to mention a book of essays that uh, my congregation was kind enough to uh, uh, helped publish a couple of years ago. So the title of it you heard was Torah for its intended purposes. And that's my translation of the, of the phrase Torah lishma. Torah lishma is often translated as Torah for its own sake, this ivory tower idea. I mean, I had teachers who told me that, that the less relevant the subject is, the more religiously meaningful it is, because you're doing it for the sake of Torah itself. Yeah. But uh, I remind you that there's a rabbinic text that says, uh, chesed you know, that's from the end of Proverbs, from uh, Eshet Chayel. They said, what is a Torah shel chesed and Torah shel chesed? So they say, Torah lishma 
Zohi Torah shel chesed. Do you think that means being in the ivory tower and not paying attention to what Torah is supposed to be doing out there? Torah l'shem mashahu means for the sake of it. Torah lishma means the Torah for the, that's done for the sake of which Torah, the, for its intended purposes, for the purposes for which it was given. So yes, if we don't answer some of the why questions, we're going to lessen the number of people who are going to want to come into the what, because why would they? Why would I study mathematics if I didn't think it was going to be useful to me? Well, some people will, because it's, you know, it's that Lithuanian thing, you know, the world within a world. I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not downing it. That was my, my maternal grandmother came from, from, from Vilna, and it's a very dominant gene. I've been fighting it my whole life. Um, but, um, and I think I've made some progress. Um, but, um, uh, but for many people, they want to know, how is this going to make me, um, make me a different kind of person in the world, able to, uh, to create things, to understand things, to, uh, you know, to, to thrive? Um, so we do have to answer those questions, and that, that there is a connection between that and the what. Uh, well, it is, I, first of all, I would say it's a Zionism that takes seriously what I think probably every single prime minister of Israel from its inception has said in one form or another, which is, I consider myself to be the prime minister not just of the state of Israel, but of the entire Jewish people. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu is not the only one who said that, and maybe not in exactly those words, but they've all given that message. So to take that seriously is to say, you know, we have... You know, it's a question of achrayut, uh, that uh, we, we have to take responsibility for, uh, for what happens in our name. And yes, there are, there are issues as, uh, as there are in, in one's own country, uh, as a diaspora Jew, that you may not have uh, access to all of the information, particularly when it comes to security issues. Um, that never, that, in my view, that never absolves you from raising what seems prima facie to be, um, um, you know, questions of, uh, of inequity and uh, injustice as long as there's a court system to, uh, to adjudicate those, uh, those protests. And I have to tell you, I, I have never taken uh, well to the idea that um, because American Jews, by and large, with a few exceptions here and there, don't have children going to the army here, that that makes it uh, just completely out of bounds for them to have any opinion about what the security issues are. If that were the case, most American Jews would have nothing to say about American foreign policy and American security either, because most Jews do not send their kids to the American army either. So if you are part of the polis, which Zionism has, and, and, and Israel has said, we are, we're supposed to be, um, I, I think it's, it is a matter of uh, of, of, of responsibility. I mean, it has to be done in a respectful way and, you know, in a polite way, and a, but sometimes politeness uh, has to give way to a sense of urgency. Um, so I, um, I, what I'm, I'm going to suggest uh, a, a book that 
uh, some people may want to read. It's not the easiest read in the world uh, by uh, Barry Wimfeimer, and the, the exact title is escaping me now, but it's kind of the, n narr law, the narration of the law. What? Narrating the law. Narrating the law. Right. Uh, it can be a little tough going, but it is exploring exactly uh, what you're talking about. Um, look, Heschel at one point says um, in a, just an introduction to the, uh, to the second volume of Torah Min HaShemayim, he goes back to the, um, to the mission at the beginning of Bav Metziah, Shnayim Ochazim B'Talit, Zeh Omer Kula Shaliv, Zeh Omer Kula Shaliv. Um, and this is a very a good example of a, of, a, of a halachic thing that seems to have no particular sociological, theological, it's, it's a way of adjudicating a dispute in court. Uh, but Heschel brings it up because he's talking about the, the, the different pulls that we have on ourselves as, uh, as contemporary modern Jews. And he's well aware of the fact that the solution that the Mishnah gives is Zei Shavash Embo and the other one gives the same that you, everyone has to be able every side has to be able to say I can't make I can't make the extravagant claim that I own any more than half of this and I'm going to have to find a way to create this, uh, this izun, this, uh, this balance, this equilibrium between the two. I do believe that's exactly how Heschel viewed halacha and agadah. I think what, what the little bit that I read to you from that Bialik essay essentially says it, um, that the, 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 the flower which attracts you, that gets to the, to the why question that was just asked, is going to give way to the fruit which is going to in some ways nourish you, but those seeds are going to produce a new flower and you better stick around long enough to see how this develops so that you are able to judge the suitability of the next fruit that appears. So that there is a, a give and take and a, and a balance there and uh, we just have to stop saying it's only Agadah. We have to stop saying that, um, uh, you know, this Mana'e uh, Midrash how how, uh, how beautiful is this midrash, but unfortunately it has uh, really nothing to speak to us in terms of uh, the practicalities of how we, how we live. And I do think this is, uh, if we are able to hold on to this, this is, this is something that we can take out into the world with us as a movement here and frankly as a movement back home. I, um, My home. So I guess my short answer is I can't uh, I can't avert to you that it I that it isn't in some way. But I think uh, if that if, if that's something that is to be seriously explored, then people have to get together first, articulate <laughs> what it is that we're really about, and not just define ourselves as we will we will paskin from the Yerushalmi as well as, as well as the Bavli. We will sometimes go to minority opinions when you don't. I mean, we tend to. We tend to define ourselves those ways, and, and um, they're, they're time-honored halachic methods, uh, but they can't be the totality of what we are bringing to the Jewish world. If, it, if in fact, the Masorti Judaism and Reform Judaism at some point in the near or distant future can get together and decide this is actually who we are and we have a total agreement on it, where is it written that that can't, that that can't create some kind of a merger? Uh, that hasn't happened yet in, in large part, I think, because there hasn't been that kind of clear definition, uh, positive definition of, of what each of us are, certainly not, not on our side. So this was meant, I think, to kind of um, prod us along a little bit and uh, give us a sense that uh, there are things in our classical tradition, there are things in the Zionist tradition, uh, there are things in the, uh, 
in, in, in kind of the world of, of moral philosophy and, um, and uh, the Heschel sense of uh, being, being sensitive to the divine pathos that can, um, that can guide a, uh, a, a self-definition that will be more compelling. <laughs> it seems to me that at the end of a life, what a person wants is not a list of how meticulously <coughs> they observed the law, but what their impact was in the world. And if we allow the meticulousness of observance to blot out the opportunity to change the world, to have an impact that will um, really do what is right, that hopefully we got both from the halakha and from the Agadah, then I think we have missed the whole point of religion. And I would say to my sortie here and conservative Jews in America that we are at a moment in time, particularly with the immigration issue, that we must remember our moral indignation and we must act on it. And if we don't, I think we've lost an important moment. Mm, yes. Yeah. By the way, you know, back in the United States, you have it a little less so here, but we've got a, a, whole, a whole other, you know, philosophical and theological issue about a, um, a, a battle for the cogency of the whole concept of truth. I'm, I'm quite serious. It's one of the most disorienting things that a person or a culture can go through. You know, kol ha'adam kozev, every person will tend to lie. We can survive that because it's always been that way. People recognize what the truth is. They know, recognize the truth is going to hurt me in this instance and I'm going to lie because of it. That person is paying indirect homage to the truth. When there is no such definition of truth anymore, when it's just a matter of whatever, whatever can be said that will that will get you to the get you to the next, you know, the next parak, so to speak. Um, something has uh, really been destroyed, and it is a theological issue because our tradition says, God's signet ring is is truth. That's when you that's when you see God. If we are in a krav al haemet, if we're battling for the truth, we're battling for God. So these are things that uh, we've got to worry about back home. I think as a movement and maybe raise our voices more than we have. Um, and maybe you have a little bit of that here as well. Thank you, Natata Chesed, Yaakov, Chesed, Abraham. Thank you very much. You can, you, you can, if you really work at it, and you use one of those book search engines, find a copy of, order a copy of Torah for its intended purposes. I think this is probably the first time it's ever been plugged like this. Like, but. It is really, it is really, really worth reading. If you enjoyed a taste of what Rabbi Tucker's Torah is about, then you'll really enjoy the book. Thank you all.